Christos Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. All right. Happy Mother's Day as well. I think that's the day too. Um, so yeah, a, a new season in the church, the Holy 50s, after the resurrection of the Lord. We came out of season of uh, the Holy 55 days, the Great Lent, a season of repentance and kind of self-focus. Obviously, not self-focus in an egoistic way. We still focus on God, but we were working on ourselves a little bit. Even the church, a lot of the hymns were, I have sinned, uh, have mercy on me, things that we're kind of working on ourselves and, and, and awaiting the resurrected Christ, preparing ourselves for him. And then the resurrection happens, and now the resurrected Christ who we've been preparing for is here. And this season is a season of discovery. The holy 50 days, we start to know who is the risen Christ. The first week was last week, Thomas Sunday, after the resurrection. And in Thomas Sunday, Thomas himself is the one that tells us who Christ is. He says, my Lord and my God. And right off the bat, we know that we discover the resurrected Christ is our Lord and our God. This week, Christ himself tells us something about himself. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. Next week will be the Samaritan woman, where Christ tells her, I am he, speaking about the Messiah. And he tells her that he has the living water. The week after is Christ as the light of the world. He tells us, I come as a light into the world. And then the week after that, the fifth week, Christ will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he tells us also, he who sees me has seen the Father. And then finally, week six, before the Pentecost, Christ will tell us he is the victorious Christ. He tells us, I have come to overcome the world. I have overcome the world. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Today, though, he focuses on one aspect of himself, and he tells us this, I am the bread of life. We actually continue the story from uh, Vespers and Matins. In Vespers, he says another I am statement. He says, I am he, do not fear. He came to the disciples in Vespers. Uh, they were on a boat, and he came walking on the, uh, on the water, and they feared, obviously. It's not normal to see someone walking on the water in the middle of the night. So Christ told them, I am he. Do not fear. He tells us he's with us, and he tells us he is our nourishment. He is the bread. Origen, the teacher, actually contemplates on the whole bread. Uh, he tells us bread in the scripture is the word for nourishment. That's why, for example, Moses, when he went on the mountain, it said he did not eat bread or drink water. You know, by bread, they mean nourishment in general, like he just didn't eat. And in the, uh, our father, in the prayer that the Lord gave us, we said, give us today our daily bread. Give us today our nourishment. The Greek, actually, that word, the daily bread, is a very difficult word to translate in Greek because it only happens in the gospel in one incident. It's actually two, one in Matthew and one in Luke. But only in our Father, that word, epiusion, does not repeat in the Bible anywhere else. It just talks about the bread that is in uh, our Father. It only happens once, well, I guess twice, but in one prayer in the Bible. And Origen actually contemplates on that word itself, epiusion. Um, and he says epi means above. It's a preposition. And then usio is nature. So he's saying we're not asking for just any bread. When we stand and say, give us today our, our bread, we're not asking for any bread or any nourishment. We're asking bread that is above nature, that is above this world, that is out of this world, that is above anything this world can provide. Epiusium, that's the word uh, that, uh, that Christ uses. Obviously, in English, we get the closest one is daily, but it's not, it's not an exact translation. It's very difficult to translate that word. Even in Arabic, you'll find a few different translations depending on the Egbeya or the version of the Bible. But yeah, that's the bread that Christ gives us. He gives us a nourishment that is outside of this world, that is not comparable in this world. Origen actually keeps going and he says that this bread is not for everyone. He says not everyone can receive the solid and strong nourishment of God's teaching. Therefore, wishing to give an athlete's nourishment suitable to more perfect Christ says, the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And in here we know what bread Christ is talking about. He's not going to give us something that is external to himself. He is literally giving us himself as bread. And sacramentally, we celebrate it every week on the altar as the body and blood of Christ. 
Clement kind of takes it in a different way, Clement of Alexandria. And he says this, and I stopped at this quote actually for a long time. He says, one who possesses the word, who is almighty God, one who possesses the word. The word that kind of took me by surprise is possesses. How can someone possess God or own God or like God is uncontainable? But that's, that's the word that I actually stopped on for a while, and I still don't understand it, to be honest with you. But he says, the one who possess God, the one who has God, the one who is looking for God, and that's, that's all he cares about, that's all he has. He says, the one who possesses God, uh, the one who possesses the word, who is almighty God's, needs nothing, never lacks any of the things he desires. For the word is an infinite possession and the source of all wealth. So one who actually strives to just have God. Lord, you are my, you are my uh, bread. That's what I want. I don't want the bread of this world only. I'm asking for something outside of this world. I'm asking for the one that created the world. He who focuses on that, he who has, he who possesses the word. It's a very, very tough word to, to swallow for me. I don't know why. But it's, a, it's, it's an interesting word that St. Clement uses. He who possesses the word lacks nothing and needs nothing. Christ himself When God wanted to give us a gift, he didn't give us something that he made or something that he shares. He gave us himself as a gift. He gave us himself as the bread. He says, I am the bread of life. And it's important because in Christ, we find not just a nourishment that keeps us um, alive physically, but alive spiritually and energetic spiritually. As in Isaiah, he tells us, but those who wait the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The nourishment that Christ gives us soars us to the heavens. The problem comes, though, when Christ stands in front of us and says, I am the bread. I'm giving you myself. And we go, what? Eh, thanks, but no thanks. I'll have what he's having. I'll have what she's having. Christ is like, I'm giving you the bread of life. I'm giving you myself. And we look to someone else or something else or anything else and be like, no, I'm good. I'll just have what they're having. And Clement actually says something about that too. He says, one who pos- he says then too, he, he has this advantage that he can be free from feeling any want. He's still talking about the one who possesses the word. And he says, the word who acts as our educator gives us riches. There is no need to envy the wealth of others with those who have gained freedom from want through him. There is no need to envy the wealth of others with those who gained freedom from him. When Christ comes and opens his arm and tells us, I am the bread of life, the question is on our side. How do we deal with that? How do we respond to that? Do we look at something else? Do we say, no, thank you. I'd rather have what they're having. Do we actually go and do what he tells us to do and take the bread that he gives us? Father Matthew the poor is actually in one of his sermons on uh, fasting. He's talking about in the Great Lent. He gives this example. He says, Sometimes we are like a sick child where his mother comes and tells him, son, eat, eat, you're hungry. And the child is like, no, I'm good. I don't, I don't want to eat now. Comes again a day later, two days later. You eat, you have to eat. You can't, uh, your skin and bones, you can't live like this. Eat, please. And the child is like, no, I don't, I don't want food, I'm good. And the mother keeps coming again, please eat, begging him. That's what Christ does with us sometimes. Like, my son, just stand and pray just once a day, just twice a day, just three times a day. Whatever you can give me, I'll take. And sometimes we're like, oh, I'm busy. I'm good. I'd rather have this. I'd rather have that. Come to me. Open the Bible and eat my nourishment that I'm giving you, my teaching, like Clement of Alexandria says. And sometimes we're like, well, you know what? I'm good. I'm good for now. It's like a mother begging her child. And the crazy thing is, Christ is begging us, entreating us for our own salvation. He doesn't really need anything from us. Origen actually said it himself. He says, God seeks from us and entreats us, entreats us, begs us. God, God seeks from us and entreats us, not because he needs something that we have to give him, but after we have given it to him, he will on account, he will account that very thing to us for our salvation. So after we give him something, he gives it back to us for our salvation. When we stand before God and quote-unquote give him time or give him attention, it is really for our salvation. God doesn't need anything from us. 
He's there to give us bread, to give us nourishment. That's really all he cares about, and that's all he wants. But the only way we can have that nourishment is with him and through him. And he knows that. And that's why he makes himself available. And stand on the door knocking day after day, trying to give us that bread. And a lot of times we turn him away. He stands begging, and we turn him away. And in here, during the Holy 50s, is the perfect time to discover God again, to rediscover God again. Because it's the season in the church, a season of discovery. Every, every week, Christ will tell us something about himself, something new, something that help us discover him. And one of the, one of the quotes, actually, it was given by a biologist. Um, he said, uh, break down the shackles of familiarity. If you want to enjoy this world, obviously, he's a biologist, so he's talking about nature and and the earth and from that aspect. But he says, break down the shackles of familiarity. Sometimes when we're too familiar with something, we just kind of go on autopilot. Like for example, if you're driving a commute every day, you'll notice you don't really appreciate the sights you're seeing every day. It becomes almost like second nature. You remember where you start and you remember where you end and the middle kind of goes away. You don't feel it. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous in spiritual life. So he tells us, Break down the shackles of familiarity. Look at that bread that Christ gives as you've never eaten it before. Open the Bible as if you're opening it for the first time. Say our Father as you've never uttered these words before and contemplate on every word. Break down the shackles of familiarity. Let us rediscover our bread, Christ himself, in a new way. Let us rediscover Christ in a way we have never discovered him before. And that's the perfect and the beauty of the Holy 50 Days. Let us sing a new song. Not a new song that's like newly written, but a new song, something that we've never experienced before. May God grant us this holy 50 days to be uh, peaceful in a time of discovery and a time of joy. And uh, may God fill our life with his joy and, and the joy of resurrection. May glory be to God forever and ever.